Civil War veteran Captain Richard Bros of New York was not a geologist. He was an engineer by vocation, and yet he would make the most significant geological find in the state of Kentucky's history. On the headwaters of the Elkhorn Creek at the Big Sandy River, in a little place soon to be known as Jenkins, Kentucky. Located in Letcher County, Kentucky, on the Virginia border along US-23, is a sleepy little town called Jenkins. At first glance, Jenkins looks like any other coal camp town. However, because of its history, topography, and geology, Jenkins is a very unique place for quite a few reasons that do not come readily to the eye. It is nestled at the foot of the 126-mile-long Cumberland or Pine Mountain, and within its city limits is the headwaters for two rivers. Jenkins itself sits on the headwaters of the Elkhorn Creek of the Big Sandy River. However, just across the rise, as you travel to the top of the Cumberland Mountain, is the head of the Kentucky River. Traveling on at the mountain, one cannot escape the way that US-23 was cut into the mountain itself. It is officially recognized as a distinguished geological site by the Kentucky Society of Professional Geologists and is considered to be, quote, one of the most remarkable exposures of rock in the entire eastern United States, unquote. The cut itself displays an extraordinary outcropping of nearly the entire section of late Devonian, Mississippian, and early Pennsylvanian stratigraphy. At the top of the mountain is a natural gap with deep historical and geological significance, it is officially known as a wind gap because no streams flow through it. The gap is now called Pound Gap, however it was named the Soundy Gap on its discovery by Christopher Gist in 1751. But to the locals in the early 1900s, it was known as, quote, Old Cumberland Gap, unquote. After its discovery, it was used for decades by hunters, including Daniel Boone, as an entry point into Kentucky. And by the late 1700s, many pioneer settlers, especially from the western counties of Virginia, made Pound Gap their main point of entry into Kentucky, because the two rivers at the foot of the mountain were used as highways, leading to the heart of Kentucky or to the Ohio Valley. Originally, a series of Indian trails led to and from the Gap. However, in 1817, construction had begun on the Mount Sterling Pound Gap Road. The road was constructed and improved at state expense by local contractors using picks, shovels, and horse-drawn graders, and before the Civil War had become Eastern Kentucky's main highway. The road was primarily used in the iron and salt trade. However, it was also used to drive horses, cattle, and hogs raised in Central Kentucky to the livestock markets in Abington, Lynchburg, and other Virginia towns. During the Civil War, Pound Gap was used by both the Union and Confederate armies. The Kentucky 5th Infantry, under Confederate General Humphrey Marshall, built breastworks and a camp consisting of 60 log huts capable of accommodating about a dozen men each, along with 10 commissary buildings and one large house used as the headquarters for Major J.B. Thompson, the Commandant of the Post. On March 16, 1862, General and future President James Garfield routed the rebels at the top of the mountain with a flanking maneuver and burned all the buildings after the battle. Later in 1864, during a raid toward central Kentucky, Confederate cavalry under John Hunt Morgan forced a small Union detachment from Pound Gap. Later, Morgan would also use the Gap as an evacuation route out of the state. However, all that aside, the most unique thing about Jenkins, Kentucky, is that in January 1910, it did not exist. Yet within 15 years, it would go from a pasture with a few log houses to a modern city of 10,000 people. This amazing story begins 133 years ago.
Captain Richard Brose of New York became involved with the search for minerals beginning with the early development around the Oil City area in Pennsylvania. He later went to California and after an unsuccessful venture to find gold and silver in the Sierras, Brose came to the lower reaches of the Big Sandy River in 1881 in the interest of Horace Walbridge, a prominent merchant and railroad man of Toledo. He started his search near Louisa. Not liking what he found, he moved upriver where he uncovered the Miller's Creek seam. After reporting his findings on the Walbridge project and purchasing 10,000 acres for his principals near Van Leer, Brose continued to survey and explore along the Big Sandy River. In 1883, Brose had heard a rumor about an abandoned survey that had been done on the Elkhorn Creek from Elkhorn City south to Ashcamp, Kentucky. He came to Ash Camp in April of that year, and after verifying the report of the earlier survey, he broadened his survey and found mineable coking coal in the area. However, he concluded that since the seam was so close to the Cumberland Fault, that it was limited in its extent. At this point, it is notable to mention that Bros had been opening small coal mines along the Big Sandy River and shipping the coal by barge downriver to the Van Leer area where they would be offloaded to trains and shipped across the country. However, the Ash Camp coal, being on the Elkhorn branch of the river, was too far up the river to allow the heavy coal to be shipped by barge. However, having the backing of railroad tycoon Horace Walbridge, Brose was sure that if he could find a coal field of significant value, the railroad could be persuaded to extend to this remote region of Kentucky. It is also worthy to note that it is at this time the story of Richard Brose standing in the Elkhorn Creek in Pike County examining a piece of coal is likely to have occurred. Because suddenly in September of that year he broke camp, moved 14 miles upriver to the headwaters of the Elkhorn Creek near what is now called Jenkins. There within a short time Brose found the coking coal he had long sought after near the mouth of Joe's branch. There were several seams of coal in the area. The one that interested Brose the most, he named the Elkhorn Number 3 seam, and spent several years opening the coal in countless places for miles around the area, testing it for quality, searching for its boundary limits, and purchasing the rights to all the coal that matched his standards. The achievement of Brose only became apparent years later, when it was found that the chemical makeup of the coal he purchased changed so drastically within a few miles of Jenkins that it required shipment to a different market. Ironically, Bro's backer, Horace Walbridge, died in January of 1893, and Bro's was never able to get the railroad to expand into the area. Broken disheartened, Bro's eventually sold all of his holdings to John C. C. Mayo for a mere sum of $30,000. Mayo sent his own survey teams into the area to verify the findings of Brose, and in 1907, armed with the survey information and the offer of land already producing coal at the Miller's Creek development, he approached the chairman of the Consolidation Coal Company, Senator Clarence W. Watson, with a proposal. The result was the immediate purchase of Miller's Creek and an option to purchase the area known as the Elkhorn Creek after consolidation could verify the findings of Brose and Mayo's men. The Consolidation Coal Company, or CONSOL, sent an army of surveyors, engineers, geologists, and chemists into the area. The report they did said that the area around the Elkhorn Creek was the most valuable coal find in the United States. This was further confirmed by experts brought in from Canada and England, who estimated that the land would yield 12,000 tons per acre an estimate that was far conservative in Consol's own words from their book in 1934, which stated that they had already mined 500 million tons, and they now expected the coal seams in the area to yield up an additional 1 billion tons or more. It is of interest to note that the area is still producing coal over 100 years after the first mine went into operation. In the spring of 1909, having the reports in hand, Senator Watson convened a meeting of Consolidation's Board of Directors and Financial Backers, along with John Mayo and others from his Northern Coal and Coke Company. The particulars of the meeting are unknown. 
However, shortly thereafter, Consol went into negotiations with the Lexington and Eastern Railroad Company to extend their railway line approximately 100 miles from Dumont near Jackson in Wolf County to a place known as Wright's Fork on the head of waters of the North Fork of the Kentucky River. The interest of Consol on Wright's Fork had to do with the survey report finding that the coal there ranged from 7 to 19 feet thick with an average height of 14 foot. However, after a survey done by the l &E Railroad, they reported that it would be late 1912 to early 1913 before the job could be completed. At the same time, Consolidation invested heavily in the Sandy Valley and Elkhorn Railroad. In 1902, the Baltimore and Ohio, or B&O Railroad, trying to compete for Kentucky timber and coal with the Chesapeake and Ohio, or C&O Railroad, issued bonds and started construction on the Sandy Valley and Elkhorn, or SV&E Railroad, from Shelby, Kentucky, now known as Shelbyana, to the headwaters of the Elkhorn Creek. However, by 1909, only 10 miles of the railroad had been completed. Although Consol's investment would greatly speed the construction of the SV&E, the rail would still take over a year to complete. Because of its remoteness, the situation in Letcher County was unique. Other than a few farms and the small town of Whitesburg, the county had no settlements of any size and a very small population. This and the fact that the construction needed to begin right away presented a series of large logistical problems that would have to be overcome. Situated just off US 23 on the Kentucky-Virginia border is the picturesque little town of Jenkins, Kentucky. The town is unique for quite a few reasons, the largest of which is that in the spring of 1910 it did not exist, and yet within 15 years the Consolidation Coal Company would build a thriving modern city of 10,000 people. The David A. Zagir Coal and Railroad Museum invites you to come and discover the history of this small eastern Kentucky town that in 1913 inspired a journalist with the Ashland Daily Independent to write, quote, Jenkins, a modern city in the mountains and the newly found capital of an inland empire whose lakefront and clubhouse looks more like a resort than a mining camp, unquote. Located in downtown Jenkins, the museum is housed in a restored 1921 train depot and houses a fine collection of photographs, artifacts, and script from the coal camp era, which includes over 40 years of memorabilia collected by David A. Zagir, former manager of the Beth Elkhorn Corporation and assistant secretary of labor for the Mine Safety and Health Administration. The museum is open Tuesday through Saturday from 11 to 5 and from 1 to 5 on Sundays, and is a perfect place to learn about the history of not only Jenkins, but the rest of Letcher County during the Jenkins Homecoming Festival in August, which kicks off a series of festivals throughout the county that runs well into September, culminating with the Mountain Heritage Festival in the county seat of Whitesburg. We look forward to seeing you there. January 1910. The Consolidation Coal Company is faced with a dilemma. They had purchased options on 100,000 acres of land, land that, according to four separate survey reports, was the richest coal field in the nation, land that, as far as transportation was concerned, was cut off from the rest of the industrial world. Being at the headwaters of two rivers, it had no navigable waters, and the roads were little more than trails through the woods. To make matters worse, the population in the area was sparse and did not have the skill sets needed for construction, nor could it sustain the sizable workforce needed to complete the project. Two railroads had been contracted to extend their lines. The Lexington and Eastern had the furthest distance at 100 miles. However, the wide flood plains along the banks of the Kentucky River would allow the construction to move along at a quick pace but it would still take almost two years to reach the coal field. The Sandy Valley and Elkhorn, while only having to extend their line a little over 20 miles, had the greater challenge, as the river flowed along the narrow valley between the Cumberland Mountain and its foothills. 
and was scheduled to enter the headwaters of the Elkhorn in 18 months. This would mean that the construction of the mining towns would take a period of four years before the first coal would be shipped. In the fall of 1910, a solution to Consol's dilemma was found. Eight miles across the Cumberland Mountain near a town called Pound, Virginia, there was a little used spur of the Interstate Railroad, or the IR&R, through a connection at Glade Morgan, Virginia. The interstate was a short haul operation providing transportation of coal from several of the mining operations in Wise County, Virginia, to the l &N Railroad at Appalachia. A year earlier, Interstate's parent company, the Virginia Coal and Iron Company, had acquired financial backing to extend their line and make a connection with the Norfolk and Western Railroad in Norton, Virginia. Consol would pay to have the interstate spur extended four miles to a spot near present-day Elmira, Virginia. It is to here that Consol would have the work crews, supplies, equipment, and construction materials shipped and unloaded, then transported across the mountain using wagons and sleds to the first construction site a town they would name Jenkins in honor of George Carroll Jenkins, a Baltimore banker and one of the directors of the Consolidation Coal Company. Mr. Jenkins and his wife, Catherine Key Jenkins, were from two of Baltimore's most prominent families. For nearly a century, the Jenkins family ran Jacobian Jenkins, Baltimore's most prestigious maker of sterling silver. His wife was a great niece of Francis Scott Key, and heavily involved in Baltimore society. As a young man, Jenkins served in the 52nd Regiment of the Maryland National Guard, and in 1862 he left his father's business to serve as a private in the Confederate Army. 1st Maryland Cavalry, Company C. At the time of his death, he would be one of the oldest Confederate veterans in Maryland. After his father's death in 1882, George Jenkins became director of the Savings Bank of Baltimore and the Merchants Mechanics National Bank. Later, Mr. Jenkins would become a director of the Atlantic Coast Line, the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, and the Safe Deposit and Trust Company. He was also a director of United Railways, the Baltimore and Ohio Southwestern Railroad, the Canton Company, the Maryland Life Insurance Company, and the Consolidation Coal Company. However, in 1909, Jenkins had approved of a loan for a company in Virginia so that they could extend their railroad line and make a connection with the Norfolk and Western Railroad in a little town called Norton, Virginia. By this time, the Consolidation Coal Company and John Mayo had finally agreed on a deal for the lands. Although the actual purchase price is unknown, the deal Mayo made with Consol was extraordinary for the time. Typically, coal camps consisted of a company store and shanties used as housing for the miners. However, Consol was to build, quote, modern cities with all the amenities of the 20th century, unquote, for the miners and their families, and the stores and services of these cities would also be open for trade with the local population. Consol would also pay the miners 35 cents per hour, in addition to the customary script to encourage trade with the local towns and bring prosperity to the people of the mountains. Mayo and his associates would also become major stockholders in the Consolidation Coal Company. A total of 12 deeds were made out for the lands. Six were signed in November 1910 after the planning and the construction crews began arriving on the Elkhorn Creek. The other six were signed in February 1911 after the construction had begun. Within a few short months, tent cities were erected on both sides of the mountain as the construction crews began pouring into the area. The first crews arrived before the rail spur could be finished. These two crews went to work on both sides of the mountain, expanding the road across the mountain and through the town gap. As hundreds of men started pouring into the area, the logistical problem of feeding them came to the forefront. Soon the shelves of the little country stores were bare as supplies for such a number had never been needed, and the local population could not grow enough food to feed all of the men. To alleviate this, Consol sent in additional crews and supplies and opened up mess halls on both sides of the mountain. Eventually, the road spur and the newly widened road across the mountain were finished, and as the equipment needed for the real work began arriving, 
the road crews moved on to establish a new road across the mountain from what is now Dunham to Wright's Fork or Mac Roberts and downriver to the little lumber camp known as Chip. Across the mountain in Elmira, the trains began arriving at a rate of 20 cars per week. These had to all be hand unloaded and reloaded onto the wagons and sleds used to transport the equipment, materials, supplies, and goods across the mountain. The list of men and equipment arriving included nine sawmills, two brick plants, two narrow gauge locomotives, along with the rail and cars needed for two construction trains to speed up the construction, and twelve boilers and generators for a power plant. The men, including lumberjacks, architects, masons, railroad men, plumbers, carpenters, plasterers, and electricians. Consol would use sleds and teams of oxen to drag the heavier equipment across the mountain. By far the heaviest items were the electrical generators and boilers. These weighed in at 16 tons or 32,000 pounds each and would require 20 head oxen teams and take days to drag them the five miles to the construction site. After the road to Mac Roberts had been finished, one of the construction trains, along with a brick plant and six sawmills, will be drug across the new road to be used in the construction efforts on the Kentucky River. Some of the first equipment to arrive were the sawmills and the brick plants, along with two types of kilns, a dry kiln to cure the lumber and the lime kiln to help compact the soil at the construction sites, as well as to make plaster and mortar for the buildings. As these arrived and were put into operation, more permanent buildings and structures began to be erected. From the very start, Consol was concerned about the health, safety, and morale of the workers and constructed a small temporary hospital complete with two doctors and a nurse as one of the first buildings in the town. Others included the clubhouse, which in the early stages of construction had a dual purpose of housing men till more houses could be built and as a bathhouse complete with hot and cold running water. A temporary YMCA was constructed complete with a bowling alley, theater, and soda fountain where the men could relax and engage in various leisure activities and a temporary bakery from which bread was loaded into wagons by the shovelful three times per day and distributed to the workers. Almost everything used would be made on site except concrete, glass, nails, and roofing. The concrete was shipped in in massive amounts for the construction of two reservoirs. A group called J.S. Byers and Company would first construct the Goodwater Reservoir, built to hold 1.2 million gallons of water, on the side of the Cumberland Mountain near a limestone spring. Massive pipes were laid out from this site throughout the town and would eventually be connected to all the buildings and houses, for drinking water and fire plugs were put in for fire prevention. The next was destined to become the main source of water for the town and the power plant. The Elkhorn Dam would require 5,000 cubic yards of concrete and impound 70 million gallons of water. Jenkins would become the regional office for Consol, and according to the Mountain Eagle dated June 6, 1912, construction was being done simultaneously on 1,000 buildings from Burdine to Dunham. To help in this massive endeavor, consolidation would bring in some of the finest men representing some of the best known construction companies in the country. The work crews numbered in the thousands, and the miners had not yet begun to arrive. The nationally known Nicola Building Company of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania owned the sawmills and ran the logging operations. They were also in charge of building the housing along with the other wooden structures needed throughout the project. Because of the massive number of houses and other building units needed and the tight timetable, one of their architects came up with what was then called, quote, box frame housing, unquote. Traditionally, housing was either built using the slat or pole frame methods, which involved building the walls of the building and then attaching the floors, ceilings, etc. However, this revolutionary construction method would cut the time of construction by three quarters and increase the strength of the building tenfold. The new method required the flooring to be laid down first, and then each room was built like building a box. Today, this method is the universal construction method used across the country and is called platform framing. By 1913, hundreds of houses had been built from Burdine to Mac Roberts, 
and were regarded as, quote, the best built anywhere, unquote. They featured fireplaces, closets, pantries, porches, and electricity throughout. And by the 20s, most of the homes had running water. At first, all the construction was aided by using horse teams to move supplies around. This required Consol to import 150 horses and a vet to take care of not only them, but the teams of oxen, the dairy herd, and massive amounts of chickens brought in and being raised as a food source for the project. When the narrow gauge railroad came online, construction was tripled, as now up to 10 times the amount of lumber, brick, and supplies could easily be moved to the various construction sites and returned to the lumber mills with fresh cut timber. Consol would also construct a modern downtown city at Jenkins, made of brick and stone. The first of these buildings was the company store, which the local newspapers dubbed, quote, the biggest building in the country, unquote. They would also build one of the first power plants in the state, a mere 14 years after AC won the power wars. In all, Consol would construct 23 brick buildings in town, including a school, office buildings, a church, and a modern hospital. Although Consol constructed at least four other towns, the rest of the company buildings would all be constructed of wood other than the chimneys and supports. However, not long after Jenkins was finished, the towns of Chip, now called Neon, and Whitesburg started building with brick. One can only surmise as the brick plants disappeared that those facilities were either purchased and moved elsewhere or that Consol was selling brick for needed construction. Before any coal was ever shipped, Consol spent millions planning and developing the towns of Jenkins, Mac Roberts, Burdine, and Dunham to attract and house the workforce needed for 14 mines. The company would also pay the moving expenses for any person and their families who would move to the area to work. Consol sent out recruitment teams all around the country, including the immigration ports. And as the building efforts progressed, the YMCA auditorium took on new roles, by day training the men who would become foremen in the mines, and by night teaching the immigrants English. When one signed on with Consol, they would pay your train fare to the closest rail station. There are many stories of men being stuck in Cincinnati and elsewhere signing on with Consol to get a free ride to East Kentucky and then never showing up for work. When one got a mining job with Consol, the company gave him a house rent-free. They paid no electric, water, or sewage bill, and got coal for cooking food and heating their homes for a very small fee. Of course, the wages were small, about 35 cents per hour, and part of the wages were paid in script that could only be spent in company-owned businesses. The company, however, took care of everything from delivering groceries to simple maintenance on the homes. Our communities were at one time the envy of the country. We had department stores, meat markets, recreation centers, YMCAs, theaters, hotels, and minor league baseball teams. We also had electricity and running water long before some of the bigger cities in the state. We had a dairy farm for milk and eggs and each spring Consol provided seed for gardening to feed our families. We had schools, parks, and recreation facilities for our children, doctors, nurses, and hospitals for our sick, and the railroad in almost every town. Jenkins was established as a six-class town and was incorporated in 1912. Consol maintains in their book History of the Consolidation Coal Company, 1864 to 1934, that they had always strived to improve the working and living conditions of their employees. However, they do admit that after entering the coal fields of Kentucky, that this effort was tripled. The ultimate expression of this occurred in the towns in Letcher County, especially Jenkins. In all, Consol would spend $40 million dollars or one billion in today's money on the development in Letcher County.
Although Consol maintained non-union mines, they had a board called the Consolidation Employees and Miners Association that was maintained at each of its operations. These associations met bi-monthly and discussed working and living conditions, and the company encouraged its employees to voice any concerns at these meetings. In addition, Consol maintained a service called Employment Relations Department, a forerunner of today's human resources on steroids. The Employment Relations Department oversaw, quote, the health, education, amusement, and recreation of the workers, unquote. The department maintained medical facilities in each of Consol's towns and a hospital at Jenkins. They employed 18 full-time physicians, five rotating dentists, scores of graduate nurses, now called nurse practitioners, and hundreds of nurses throughout their towns. The duties of the nurses went far outside the medical profession as they taught classes on hygiene, cooking, sanitation, first aid, and immunization. The medical staff was also responsible for the dairy farms and meat markets to ensure safety and quality. And nurses were assigned districts within the communities and were encouraged to visit families to learn their individual needs and make, quote, wellness calls, unquote. In this fashion, the medical and dental meets were met by the company, and group discounts were offered on death and disability benefits. The Employment Relations Department was in charge of the education and religious facilities as well, and maintained schools for the children of the minors and year-round kindergarten services. This in itself was an enormous task, as records tell us that in the 40s, the Jenkins School had close to 3,000 students. During the summer, they held classes for students and wives on topics such as gardening, canning, sewing, tools, and crafts. They maintained sports teams, a band, and literacy programs. Religious activities were encouraged, and within a few years, Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, and Episcopalian churches were established. The department employed maintenance men to do repair work on the homes, businesses, and other buildings maintained by the company, as well as ran the recreation centers and maintained the landscape parks, lakes, and sports facilities in the towns. Jenkins was built as Consol's premier model town. This is highlighted by the numerous newspapers, sporting celebrities, and other influential people that Consol brought to Jenkins to do radio shows and newspaper magazine articles about the prize fights, baseball games, and the town itself. And Consol commissioned thousands of photographs of all the towns in the area. The town of Jenkins was so picturesque that the Daily Independent, a newspaper from Ashland, Kentucky, wrote about Lakeside in an editorial. Quote, the Glove House and Lakefront look more like a summer resort than a mining camp. Unquote. In 1935, after the arrival of the UMWA, Consol turned all its land management over to a company called Elkhorn Land Management. At that point, the miners started paying rent on their homes. Slowly, more and more services were either discontinued or a fee was imposed for their use. In 1947, Consol announced that all the buildings ran by them were up for sale. The churches were deeded to their congregations for a dollar. The buildings used for the union halls were similarly deeded. The people living in the homes were given the option to buy them for $16 a month. The company stores were bought by a group called Champion Stores, who ran them until the 60s. The hotels, recreation centers, and theaters all met similar fates, and by the early 70s, most of the businesses were gone. In addition to Jenkins, Consol also built the small towns of Dunham, and Burdine close by, and her sister city, McRoberts, across the mountain on the Kentucky River. In January 1913, John Mayo offered to sell the rest of his land holdings to Consol. Unable to get financial backing because of the massive construction taking place in Letcher County, Consol's chairman, Senator Watson, along with his backer, J.D. Rockefeller, would spin off Elkhorn Fuels and name as its president his nephew, George Fleming. This, quote, new company, unquote, was completely run by employees of the Consolidation Coal Company. The collateral for the loans names the town of Fleming, Hemphill, and Hayman, now known as Hayman. It is unclear if Consol had started construction on these towns. However, Elkhorn was incorporated and bought the land in February 
started mining and shipping coal in April, and by November, hundreds of houses had been built along with six stores, three temples, four mines, and the clubhouse at Fleming were in operation. What is known that a total of eight, quote, modern cities, unquote, were constructed and 14 mines were in operation by 1915. The Southeast Coal Company entered the county in that year and built the towns of Seco and Millstone, and many other small towns sprung up along the length of both railroads. By 1925, the massive construction period in Letcher County came to a close. Thanks to the efforts of the Consolidation Coal Company and Jenkins and McRoberts, new towns and cities were being established and beginning to thrive from Jackson to McRoberts and from Paintsville to Jenkins along both rail lines. The pre-constructed cities of Neon, East Jenkins, Whitesburg, Hazard, Paintsville, Prestonsburg, and Pikeville had grown tremendously and were thriving, thus fulfilling John C. C. Mayo's dream of bringing prosperity and the pleasures of the 20th century to the people of the mountains. Faced with a market downturn, Consol sold the entire Elkhorn division to Bethlehem Steel in 1956. Bethlehem was not in the mining business. However, the Elkhorn Coal provided them with reserves for the steel industry. The new venture would be known as the Beth Elkhorn Corporation. Beth Elkhorn would continue to mine coal and run two temples in the county well into the 80s. As Beth Elkhorn ended its operations in the area in the early 90s, Consol would briefly re-enter the area and take over the Hendrix operation on the Kentucky River at Dean. This would be short-lived and the large corporate mining operations came to a halt within a few years. Today, coal is still being mined by small operations in and around the area through leases made with the Elkhorn Land Management Company. At one time, the population of Jenkins was over 10,000 people. However, over the years, as the big mining operations and businesses have slowly shut down, the population has dwindled away throughout Letcher County. Other than the houses, little of what Consol built is still standing. Although the population of Jenkins is now a little over 2,100 people, Thousands still consider it home and flock to the area each year for the Jenkins homecoming celebration. A three-day festival celebrating the heritage of the area with local music, crafts, and food and is part of a series of festivals throughout the county. In June of 1912, local newspaper man Burdine Webb wrote in the Mountain Eagle to write of all the wonderful things Consol is doing in the town of Jenkins would exhaust the mightiest of pens. Those words are true today, and since it has been said that a picture is worth a thousand words, we will close with a slideshow and a song by Kevin Crawford, one of Letcher County's many talented musicians, and a deep heartfelt thank you to Opal May Bailey, Jason Helton, and my sweet wife Joanna for their wonderful photography. Thank you.